I'd just like to say welcome to this debate today uh, in the Institutions in Crisis Strand. Uh, this is the Church and State and Marriage on the Rocks debate. It's been reported that 60, around 60% of Brits identify with Christianity. That's according to the most recent census that we had. And so it's clear that uh, religion isn't dead, despite what many philosophers, thinkers and writers have said uh, for hundreds of years. Liberal democracy has not yet killed religion. But uh, what does a single religion, the C of E, have to offer that it needs this recognition, this official recognition, in order to deliver? What, what could disestablishment allow Anglicanism to enjoy some freedom and, and to follow doctrine on recent key issues, such as the, the, the gay marriage debate or, or indeed women bishops? although there's many others, and, uh, and does the current established status prevent that freedom? So without further ado, I'll run through our speakers. To my left here, we've got John Milbank, who is a professor of religion, politics and ethics. He's the director of the Centre of Theology and Philosophy at the University of Nottingham, and he's also the author of Beyond Secular Order, so welcome to him. Uh, coming out in December. <laughs> coming out in December. Yeah. Plug that one, yeah. Yes. To, my, to my right, I have Anne Atkins, who's a novelist, columnist and broadcaster, prize-winning journalist and a regular contributor for BBC Radio 4's Thought for the Day. Uh, to her right is Mark Sidwell, who's the managing editor of City AM, a contributor and judge for the Institute of Ideas Debating Matters competition. To the furthest left, we have Rebecca Jenkins, who is a cultural historian and novelist a Royal Literary Fund Fellow and a former writing partner of the Bishop of Durham, David Jenkins, who is her father. Indeed. Uh, to her right is Dolan Cummings, an Associate Fellow of the Institute of Ideas, uh, the editor of Culture Wars and Debating Humanism, two separate publications, and also the co-founder of the Manifesto Club. So if we could just have a round of applause to welcome uh, our five speakers. Thank you. We'll start straight away. John, if you'd like to go first. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, talk about it both from the point of view of the state, is establishment a good thing, and from the point of view of the church, is establishment a good thing. And I, I want to um, point out the paradox that um, if we're talking about the secular side, the people who are in favor of disestablishment are probably largely liberals. But if we look within the Anglican church, the people in favor of establishment have been historically, overwhelmingly, the liberals. So if we're talking about the Anglo-Catholics and the evangelicals, they're somewhat divided. But there's much more suspicion of establishment amongst the conservative theological factors. Um, and this gives to the debate, I think, a somewhat paradoxical and interesting Cast. It's been rightly said that uh, disestablishment is the dog that has never barked because shortly after John Keeble gave his famous assize sermon that sparked off the Oxford movement, this was precipitated by Catholic emancipation. Um, he, everybody suspected that establishment, disestablishment might uh, follow fairly soon and it, it never has done. And it's, it's extremely interesting to reflect why. I'll leave that on hold for the moment and fast forward to what I think might be the fundamental reasons why, um, even from a secular point of view, one might not sort of get rid of um, establishment in a hurry. And I think this has to do with a much broader question about whether the mixed constitutional character of England um, plus the existence of the established church has been far more the origin of a, a blend of democracy with individual freedom and responsibility than is ever allowed. We tend to be overwhelmed by the French and the American narratives on these matters. We tend to forget that in the first place, the French and the Americans were trying to 
copy us? And how well did they do it? Is it really the case that sort of pure democracy and pure republicanism is the better guarantee of democracy, liberty, and constitutional government? Or is it instead the case that the British model is actually superior and is historically more primary? Now, we tend to see, we tend to talk about an unwritten constitution and, and about the British situation being a muddle. And I think this elides the point that at the heart of the British constitution is the precisely um, the established church. In other words, the linchpin of the British Constitution um, is the, the, the monarchy answerable to God, but also answerable to the people. So this is already a blend of the idea that law and justice need to be answerable to an eternal objective order. It's not just a matter of what people want, but on the other hand, popular consent is important as well. And the question is, do we want to overthrow that kind of balance? After all, if we're thinking about legality, in the end, the fundamental principles behind legality are ineffable things. They're almost matters of feeling. Um, and because we sense that this is more than something subjective. There's a powerful need then to baptize law, to say this is somehow rooted in natural law or divine revelation. If we are to sort of guarantee these incredibly important, ineffable foundations, then the question of the connection of law ultimately to religion should not be dismissed too casually. Because I would submit that the drift we're seeing in Europe, which is taking a deliberately secular path, is starting to look like a fearful combination of kind of Chinese instrumental bureaucracy on the one hand and an unqualified free market that you cannot call into democratic question at all. So if you ask yourself, what would a pure secular order look like, a pure imminent order, the pure rule of reason? I submit it would be a realm in which not just the religious but would be excluded, but any considerations of substantive justice in the economic realm and also in the political realm, which would tend to become more and more impersonal. And I think if we look at this in a more global perspective, we start to realize that our Western enlightenment is rooted in our particular version of what meta-historians call the axial age. In other words, the point where Plato, Confucius, the, the Hebrew prophets and so on, uh, and the Buddha all coincided. And this was the point in history at which people called into question archaic monarchies in the name of transcendence. And that gave rise to a critical sense, not just a critique of the established order, but also a critique of all the critiques. So a sense that we might be wrong is profoundly upheld by belief in God, gods, and transcendence. And it, I think especially in a more global perspective, where we're encountering other civilizations based on other versions of the axial age, we need to think again about the relevance of our situation. It's very significant that almost no members of other religions in this country want Anglicanism, the Church of England, to be disestablished. Now, to move on quickly to the point of view of, of, of of, of the church. Um, I think, first of all, it helps to keep critical arguments real. I think the Anglican church has been very good both at putting criticisms to people like Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair, but at the same time not going off into a pietistic utopian ranting precisely because they are involved in the reality of politics. The second point is that I think it keeps the church humble, embedded in a service. It's got a parish everywhere. It's not primarily about telling people what to think. It's primarily about serving people. I think embedded Christianity, people who don't just go to church, all the time is real. As a Nottinghamshire vicar said to me, the Nottinghamshire working class don't go to church, but they believe far more that the church is part of an eternal cosmic order than middle class Christians in London who think it's just a matter of personal belief. Can Embedded we... Christianity is real. So if I can um, just um, come to my final point, I think the very interesting point is 
It's not true that there's a religion called Anglicanism that's established. There's, a, there's Christianity itself in its Catholic version, meaning that it has, it's Episcopal and has sacraments. It's that that it's established. Now, if in the 19th century, I'll, I'll just finish very, this very point quickly, very, very quickly. Yeah. It seemed as if because you were allowing Catholics and nonconformists to participate, you were becoming impossibly pluralist and secularized. But now, thanks to ecumenism, there's much more a sense for Catholics and Orthodox and even for nonconformists that it is Orthodox Christianity that has been established. And what is more, with a growing sense of religious dialogue and a sense that we do have certain things fundamentally in common with Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, there is a sense that all religions feel that religion as a good is secured through establishment. Whereas militant secularists want to say there should be no religious freedom, just a freedom for, of belief in general. We'll we that. need we a recognition of, uh, of religion yeah. okay. as a public Thank good. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, I'll ask you to, to come in second there. Um, I'm here only really to talk from the perspective, um, or at least talk about, the Church of England as an established church, because that's the only thing I know a little bit about. Um, I would say this is slightly more of a joke than anything else, that if it's a church of uh, the marriage is on the rocks, it's more like um, a marriage where it's been divorced for a long time, but they're stuck in the same house due to austerity. So um, I think one of the things that strikes me most about the Church of England is you can't think of it divorced from the history and culture of our past. It has been woven into our parliamentary democracy for a very long time, at least since the Elizabethan Act of Settlement, but it was coming there since Saxon times, when religious leaders, Christian leaders, were invited. Well, they were landlords, so they were into the, the councils of the great. The point about the Church of England, in my experience, the reason I had some experience of this was because as um, a daughter, my father was appointed Bishop of Durham in the 80s, at a time of intense political dogma. It was the height of Thatcherism. Though he was appointed to the Diocese of Durham, which was a mining diocese, and it was the major mining strike that saw the end and the closure of most of the mines that at that period defined for a lot of people the life of working, working Durham. And I worked alongside him as his writing partner and his general assistant. And I remember uh, through these various debates, the Bishop of Durham is one of the five that gets an automatic place in the House of Lords of the Church of England. There are in fact 26 bishops in the House of Lords, the Lords Spiritual, and um, the top five are the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, Bishops of London, Winchester and Durham, and they all get an automatic pass. The others are by um, length of service, there are 26 in all. So there he is, parachuted in, why the hell should he have been there? The, the thing that struck me was when I saw the House of Bishops in action and you went to the Lord's Spiritual, their room, and that is the 80s, it's a long time ago now, I realise. Um, but as a female, uh, in my 20s at the time, uh, it struck me, here was a whole bunch of ageing middle class white guys. And you thought, who the hell are these people to be poncing around in their robes and um, having a place in our democracy? However, it was true, they were privileged. Most of them at that time had been to Oxford or Cambridge, if they'd fought in the war, and it was that long ago, we're talking World War One, two, not one, sorry, um, they were mostly in the officer class. However, they came with a culture that said that the Church of England was slightly different. The Church of England and Anglicans were not just there for their congregations, they were there for everybody. They were conscious of their sense of privilege, and they also believed that they were there to speak for voices that were not heard. So at the height of Thatcherism, they spoke of things that they'd heard of in their diocese. And the, the thing about the diocese is that because you have parishes everywhere, people, partly because they discount you as not really a proper religion, when people are desperate, they quite often do contact their priest or the bishop. And so the lines of communication were much more varied. I mean, I knew some, quite a few people working in politics at the time. And if I spoke to my friends who were working for the Labour Party or my friends who were working for the Conservative Party, they did not have the range of communication lines that the bishops did. And because they were there supposedly to be spiritual and to raise questions of ethics, morality, things about being human, an awful lot of things slipped through into those parliamentary discussions that wouldn't have got there otherwise. Therefore, what I'm trying to argue is this. I do not believe that disestablishment won't come at some point, but I believe it has to come organically. Right now, we live in a time where in the 1% that rule us, there are totally tribal, generally partisan views. 
you are either one party or the other, or you're p promoting some particular cause. You need a space where there are, there's enough of a gap that other voices can come through. And that is what, at this point in time, I still believe the Church of England can do. It is a service it can still give to the community. Whether or not there should be women bishops, whether or not there is about the questions of ecumenical questions and all the rest, those are all perfectly valid arguments. But I would argue at this point, given the constitution we have and our parliamentary democracy, the Church of England does have a vital space in it, and it leaves a space for voices. If you close that space down, what are you left with? And I think that's really partly what John was talking about, mm -hmm. that if you have nothing, if you, if you boot them out and you close the space down, what have you got to stand for the voices of the people who don't fit into the categories? And I'm not arguing that they all get through, but at least there's still a space where some may get through. And if you close it down, there will be none. Therefore, I think if you're going to tackle the Church of England disestablishment, you're actually beginning to unpick parliamentary democracy as we've inherited it. And that needs a hell of a lot of thought. Thank you very much. Next, if I could ask Mark, if you've got... Sure, thank you. It is said that just a few streets from here, over in Smithfield, on November the 17th, 1558, there were a number of Protestants tied to the stake. They had the wood piled up round their feet. The executioner was ready to light it on fire, to leave them to burn to death in a horrible, lingering way. And then the messenger ran up and said, Queen Mary is dead. She didn't sign the execution warrants before she died. And so they had to be cut down. And because the new queen was Elizabeth I and Protestant, they were let go. Now, Elizabeth I herself, it was a much lighter yoke as a state church. But of course, within a year, she was also putting in place a law that meant that you would be fined if you didn't go to the state church regularly. A strong state church can be an absolutely terrible thing. The great American nonconformist Roger Williams said forced worship stinks in the nostrils of God. But what I want to say today is that what we have here in England now, which is effectively a weak state church, is a rather different thing and may in fact be better for all sorts of minority faiths and for people who might be suspicious of it in principle uh, than, than they really realize. And this is a point of view that the great Enlightenment philosopher David Hume also took. Uh, not necessarily known as a great advocate of organized religion, but he believed that a civilized society needed to establish religion, in a sense, to tame it. Uh, but the main evidence that I have for this, uh, as a financial journalist, it's the area that interests me, uh, perhaps naturally, is the economics of religion, a study which goes back to Adam Smith, who wrote on it in The Wealth of Nations, but it's continued more recently by lots of academics and very good work by uh, Rodney Stark and Lawrence Yannacone, among others. And what they show, and it's not just theoretical, they have models and they can test them against the, the historical evidence and against what they find happening in real countries around the world today. What they find is that if you have a state church, no one goes to it. So it's not so much that, oh, we should get rid of a state church because the attendance is declining. Low attendance is built into the nature of a state church. And by contrast, if you want lots of people to go to your church, ideally, you would really like to be a small church in a country that has uh, a state church established as well. Uh, Sweden is a very good example of this. You're born into the Church of Sweden, you can opt out, but 90% of Swedes belong to the state church. Free church is just 10% of the population, but on Sunday, almost everyone who is in church in Sweden belongs to a free church. They get 70% attendance uh, out of their uh, church members. Uh, 45 country study of Catholics. In the countries where Catholics are fewest, that's where all the Catholics go to church all the time. That's where they do much more religious devotion. A country like Brazil, one of the biggest Catholic um, countries in the world, is having a massive incursion of people moving to Pentecostal Protestantism. So it, it doesn't have the strength that it seems to. And by contrast, disestablishment, rather than just ending something and, and leaving it to die in a corner because no one really wants it anymore, can in fact unlock a free market in religion which drives attendance at church. And this is very clear in the case of America, where it was at European levels of attendance in the 1770s, when they had established churches over there. Um, by 1850, which was just after they got rid of established churches in some of the states, um, it was up to 35% attendance from 20% at the start. It was 50% by the start of the 20th century. It's up to about 61% now. There's a sort of curve as you take away the, uh, the state and leave it to the free market. 
So simply, it's worth thinking that perhaps an established church is part of keeping the Church of England actually weak, not as part of a, a strong force in the nation, and of stimulating its rivals. And that if you get rid of it, you might not be so much blowing out a guttering candle, but more unleashing something else. We're also very near the birthplace of Methodism. There's lots of monuments to that just down the, the corner. And that came out of the Church of England, ripped itself away because it was growing faster than that church could cope with, made the world its parish, churched millions of people who had never gone to church before, uh, and in fact only really died out in England as a major force when it allied itself once again to the main established church and was more regulated. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Extraordinarily, I think I believe agree with everybody so far, <laughs> except that I, I think... an Anglican. <laughs> I must be an Anglican. Except I think, Mark, that how many Anglicans does it take to change a light bulb? the whole world, dear. Change? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Catholics, <laughs> anyway, I th though I think Mark, the Methodists were thrown out rather than voluntarily left. Well, yeah, but he... But anyway, he, don't let's... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He ordained so, people they didn't like it. Yes. <laughs> just to get a few things um, out of the way first, uh, Jesus would not have established a Church of England, I mean established in the other sense, a Church of England. Um, this is not at all how he envisaged the church. He envisaged the church as a persecuted minority. And if we were starting now, we would not build it as it is. Um, nevertheless, the fact that something, the fact that those things are both true and the fact that something can't necessarily be justified on rational grounds isn't necessarily a good reason to do away with it. Uh, the other day I was um, visiting our, our youngest Who's, who's 10, has just started as a chorister in Durham, and I visited her the other day, and she took me to Evensong. And I was in this beautiful building, hearing this beautiful music, and the same is true of that, that Jesus did not envisage Durham Cathedral and choirs in robes. Uh, and again, one wouldn't do that if one were starting now, but is that a good enough reason to do away with such a beautiful building? Would we do away with St Paul's Cathedral just because you know, of those two things. Um, so, uh, and I also want to just briefly touch on a misconception, which, which has actually been, uh, John and Rebecca have both sort of um, uh, brushed against this. Uh, the Church of England is not, contrary to myth, a club for believers. The Church of England is for everybody. By virtue of living in England, you live in a parish and you own membership of the Church of England. You, you, you do not have to prove any kind of belief to be married in the Church of England, to be baptised in the Church of England, to vote at the AGM. You're entitled to be on the electoral roll, whether you're Hindu or atheist or whatever. Now, you may not want any of these things, but it is actually for everybody. And, and, and Rebecca has demonstrated how that, you know, the, the bishops are fighting for everybody in a way that many politicians are not in a position to do. And John has shown how that, I mean, Jonathan Sachs is very good on, on that, how Anglicanism actually fosters tolerance of all faiths, and none, actually. So um, those things, you know, other speakers have dealt with more thoroughly than I will, and also questions of power and politics and so on and so forth. We may come back to this in discussion. The one thing I want to say, because it's perhaps where I have a, a unique contribution on this panel and possibly in this room, is the difference it makes at, I suppose, what you would call the coalface. I lived for 14 years in a working inner city vicarage because I'm married to a Church of England clergyman. And that is where establishment matters to me. Because I saw what it means to people who walk along the street or people who sleep under Putney Bridge or people who are, have just been through a terrible divorce or whatever it may be. Um, I saw it, not every day maybe, but every week, I saw the impact it had. Um, if I give you one story, perhaps, um, the doorbell rang, I mean, our doorbell rang all the time, all day long, if, you know, all week, all in the night, the whole time. And uh, one time it rang and uh, my husband answered the door and there was a very well-dressed um, chap there. And he said to my husband, do you remember me? Now, Sean has a very good memory, um, but he unusually said, no, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't recognize you. And he said, well, actually, I'm not surprised. I called on you, um, I think it was six months earlier. He said, I, was, um, I had nowhere to live, nowhere to sleep, nothing to live off, and I asked you for money. And you said, no, I won't give you money but come in 
and uh, you know, you can talk to me. And, and apparently, Sean, and he'd forgotten this, he sat this guy down and gave him a cup of tea and maybe a sandwich and I don't know what. Um, and he said, uh, he gave him one piece of advice. He said, you should go back to your parents. And this chap said, I was really angry with you that you wouldn't give me money. You were absolutely right. I would have just spent it on drugs. Well, we couldn't afford to give money to everybody who called at the door. But, you know, that wasn't why. He said, I, I went away very angry, but I thought about what you said. I went back to my parents. I apologised to them. And I'm now back on my feet. I've got a good job. And as you can see, you know, he was in a suit. He was well turned out. His whole life had been turned around because he had rung on our vicarage doorbell. I could give you numerous examples of that. It happened over and over again. Um, a woman who'd gone through the most terrible divorce and was completely in pieces and just happened to be walking past our vicarage and rang on the doorbell and became a member of the church and formed a social network and, again, you know, turned her life around. As I say, I could give you 20 minutes of instances of this, but I've just been shown my yellow card. What difference would disestablishment make? Maybe for half a generation or a generation, it wouldn't make a difference. But people do not call on the doors of the Methodist ministers or, or the Catholic ministers or the rabbis in that same way. These are not churchgoers. They see our vicarage. They, they know what the Church of England is. They know what it stands for. And they think maybe somebody in there will help me. Now, I feel passionately about this because we were turning people's lives around for all of those 14 years because it's an established church. It may not be rational. It may not be logical. It may not be what Jesus had in mind, but it works. And it works for people who are on their beam end. And that's why I don't want the church to disestablish. Thank you very much. We'll leave that one there. That's great. Last but not least, Delwyn, if I could ask you. Sure. Um... Well, I come to this, I guess, as a token non-Christian, or perhaps more importantly, a non-Anglican. Um, I grew up nominally in the Church of Scotland, um, which in many ways is easier to ignore than the Church of England, or perhaps even easier to ignore, um, I think, for various reasons. Uh, one, although the Church of Scotland is kind of semi-established, it's not entangled in politics in the same way as the Church of England is. And secondly, because the Reformation in Scotland was more complete, if I can put it that way, um, the, the, the Scottish Church is more in common with the Reformed tradition internationally and fewer of the quirks and peculiarities that make the Church of England English and, 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 and it's given its claim to being a peculiarly um, national church. But I suppose what, what I want to look at is, is the, the very idea of a national church, which I think is um, in, historically anachronistic. That's not necessarily to say it's, it's wrong, but it has its particular roots in a, in a different historical um, period. And what I want to look at and, 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 and take issue with in establishment is not really the idea that the church or any other religious institution exercises political power, because although there are bishops in the House of Lords, we're not really facing theocratic tendencies from the Church of England. It's not a problem for us. Um, what I would want to raise, and I think this is much more controversial, might sound odd, is um, I want to take issue with the idea of the state having religious or quasi-religious powers. Um, and I think that's been part of what's come from uh, establishment. Take a, a clear example would be marriage, um, which uh, uh, you know, ha ha happens through the church and the state kind of simultaneously as it's currently constituted. Um, traditionally, obviously, in a Christian wedding, the important thing that happens is that God joins two people together. Traditionally, a man and a woman could change, but um, that's what's happening. God is doing this. The certificate you get from the state is a ratification of that. It's not... Um, that's not anything that the state is doing. They're recognizing what, what's happened. So it raises an interesting question, what happens in a, in a civil marriage that isn't a church wedding? What, what, what exactly is going on? And there are different ways of interpreting it. And you can see it as simply recognition of an agreement between two people, two people with their families in a, in a broader context. But I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an idea which has crept in because of establishment, which is that when you have a, a, a civil marriage, um, the state is taking the place of God. The state is joining two people together. And, and doing the job of God. And the reason that, that I think that this is a prevalent idea is because it was there in the gay marriage debate. It was very clear in the gay marriage de debate that, that both sides, I mean, there were lots of arguments made on both sides, but I think predominantly on both sides, there was agreement to maintain one very important aspect of the status quo. That is that the state decides who isn't, isn't married. That it's the power of the state to marry people. Um, that, you know, this is why we, uh, you, talk, you talk about not the gay marriage um, already exists and, need, and needs to be recognized in the way that historically Catholic marriage had been established for centuries. The British state didn't recognize it until 1836, was it? 
Um, uh, I think if you wanted to make a convincing case for gamers, you'd say, look, we've got had civil partnership for some time. It's an emerging social reality, and you, we have to recognize it now. But the fact that people felt that the government had to change the law to add this pixie dust of, of this godlike power of joining people indicated to me that the, the, you know, the power of God had been uh, uh, actually moved on, on, onto the state. We've got this kind of peculiar um, uh, uh, idea. And that's what I want to object to, because I think we want to make a distinction between state powers, which arise from free association, and religious powers, which have to do with uh, a divinity. And you can, people will disagree with what that means. Um, I think that distinction is very important, um, which is why I would fundamentally object with, uh, uh, or disagree with what John was suggesting about sanctifying uh, laws. I think that's where we, our major disagreement is. Mm -hmm. Just to illustrate, um, I, I hope some of you might have seen the film Battle of Algiers, um, which is about the national uh, liberation struggle in Algeria. And there's a very pivotal scene in that where there's a, a wedding and a, a young Algerian couple get married. And there's a political statement, they choose not to be married by the colonial state they have a kind of private ceremony, which is Islamic because they happen to be Muslim, but in fact I would argue more civil in the sense of being there in civil society and not sanctified by the state. So you've got, you've got this interesting uh, idea of they're claiming marriage as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a for, as a way of expressing their independence from the colonial power. Um, I thought that was a, you know, very interesting as a political act. And that to me is civil association. It's something which doesn't need to be, have, this, uh, have a rubber stamp from, from the authorities. And I think that's what, what, we, what, what we want to have in politics, as well as in religion, in fact. So, I mean, I, I, I'm mm. sympathetic to the conservatives in the church that John talked about who objected to establishment because mm. they see um, church as something which should be through free association. And we can get on to this, this question of the default membership, you know, whether you like it or not, if you belong to the Church of England. You can see that in a nice way. You can see it in a slightly menacing way. Um, it's a question of perspective. The fundamental point that, I, that I'd want to suggest is that through establishment, that has affected the way we think about the state, living aside religion and, and the church. You have an idea that the nation is constituted by the state and the state's institutions. And I think that's fundamentally undemocratic. I think it has to be the other way around and start from, uh, from the people. The state derives its legitimacy from the people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we can probably unweave this in the discussion, um, but I'll leave it there for now. I suppose one of the first things that I would potentially like to, to start off with um, is, is this argument around the implications, and it was raised earlier on, I know we've progressed from there somewhat, but it was raised, Re uh, Rebecca, uh, by yourself, and it's around the implications of disestablishment now. So around um, f some kind of revolutionary idea that if we, if we disestablish now, it would have negative consequences for society, mm. for, for, politi for politics, and, and, and whatever, whatever and possibly other. positive implications for the church, as Mark was saying. It, the, absolutely. Well, and it depends on whether you're Smith or Hume on this, because they have an interesting debate. And, you know, I, I'm kind of an Adam Smith kind of guy, but I, I think David Hume is probably more right on this if you look at Most the modern evidence. Man, yes. But um, Hume said, you have an established church, basically, to keep the church civilised, because uh, the church used to rely really on, on land and benefices uh, for its money. It wasn't really through collection, and that meant it wasn't tied to getting support from the individual believers, and that meant that it didn't have to be so sort of gung-ho and things that people wanted. And Smith said, well, no, it's all right, really, because when you disestablish it, you get a free market, you get lots of very small churches, and they all moderate each other, and you get moderation that way. But I suspect if you look at the evidence, the really big Christianity now out in the marketplace is charismatic. Well, exactly. Generally, if you get small um, uh, churches bubbling up, they are mostly likely in their early stages to be dogmatic, sectarian, and opposing to general order in the sense that they will want the world to transform to their idea. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that socially could be very disruptive. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing I would like to say is that um, we do get a bit caught up um, in, in the sense that it's all about, because you're talking about the Church of England and, and Anglicanism, because they are Christian in their roots and origin, that means that you're talking globally about Christianity taking over as a world religion. You're not. It's actually, I think, whoever got that space, given historically that's where we are, it's also a function about how do you keep in a parliamentary democracy some window for things that aren't about the market what the dominant two-party system says is the truth yeah. and the evidence that they want to present to you as reality. Yes. And so there is the sense of a role about how do you, if you're looking at disestablishment, as I said earlier, I think you're beginning to unpick parliamentary democracy, which is a perfectly possible future. 
But if so, isn't there a question about how do you effectively, in a, 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 a universal kind of society that embraces people and gives everybody the same rights and protections, how do you keep some idea of that human beings do not simply reduce down to economic statistics, to being, um, well, you are a member of the working classes and now you're the unemployed poor. This is very bad. We have austerity. There is no, there is no money. Therefore, there is no answer. What about the voice for the people yeah. who actually say there are human beings involved? Can I, can I, can I, side? Can I, can I come in, come in here? I, 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 th I think that's, that's basically right. And I, I, I think I'm in more agreement with you on my left than, than you realise. Because, first of all, I, I don't want to sacralise law. On the contrary, my argument is that if you don't relate law to a sense of the good and the true that isn't something we've just made up, you will sacralize law. You will sacralize, um, you know, the instruments of human power. That's my argument. But I'm really sympathetic to you saying, in effect, let's begin with civil society. Let's um, have a more pluralistic kind of understanding of political and social order. Let's not have absolute sovereignty. But what is interesting here is that, you know, the prime advocates of political pluralism and distributing sovereignty, people like Harold Lasky, knew how important the church was in sustaining that, that space. And I think this relates to your arguments that in a way the, the church is like an alternative space of representation where you don't just represent people politically but socially and in all their um, various groupings. But there's just one thing I do want to make clear because I think so far this is obfuscated. My arguments for establishment are not liberal arguments. They are, they are very much conservative Anglo-Catholic arguments. So, the, But normally, I'm in basic sympathy with Anglo-Catholics and evangelicals who say most of the arguments for church establishment are ridiculous and wet because they rely on the idea that we should have a weak church, uh, that we should have a diluted Christianity, a Christianity that reduces to liberal humanism and so on. And so they tend to argue we need a more sectarian, a purer church, a church you more see, like... I would argue that isn't very Anglican, because well, Anglican well, was supposed to be yeah, the three, well, faith, it, tradition and Absolutely, reason. but if I could just finish. The, so they argue that we need this purist church that actually I don't think Jesus wanted at all, but, but um, that, that tends to be their argument. Now, my case is that this is equally a resignation to weakness, that, that it, it, it's assuming the game is up. The both arguments assume the game is up. And I think in this sort of postmodern, post-secular, more globalised phase, it's no longer so clear that the game is up. We, 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 we just don't know. And I think the kind of thing you're describing, Anne, you know, this experience where anybody comes to the door and you help them. That's not, a dim uh, that's not a diluted form of Christianity. That's a radical form of Christianity. That's, th that's a, a crazily ambitious form of Christianity. And I think what people miss about Anglicanism, that if you take somebody like Richard Hooker, it's not based on a weak version of Christian doctrine. On the contrary, Hooker has the most radical Christology of all the post-Reformation thinkers. It's Hooker who most of all emphasizes that every aspect of Jesus is, that is divine is also human and vice versa. And this has given Anglicanism this radical incarnationalism all the way through. This is not a weak Christianity, it's kind of well, muddly, strong it? Christianity. It, 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 it sort of presents yeah. as muddly. Yeah, it's but not, that's because we have terrible spokesmen and awful theologians. Yeah, but also, and, I think and, it, and we, you know, that is an easy thing and, to and, say. And, and, this, and, and you know, but myself think, and my friends are trying to do something okay. about this, but and to see that <laughs> that Anglicanism is a radical. But you see, I actually yeah. think yeah. the yeah. muddliness is a kind of strength. I mean, I most of my friends would yeah, not say that. Yeah, the right kind of muddliness. Well, if I could just also make the point, I think that what the point I made that saying that we. We now realise as Anglicans that we're in basic agreement with other Christians and in considerable agreement with people of other religions. Again, that's not a diminution not sure of Christianity. Not the evangelicals or the Anglo-Catholics do think that. Actually, let's, <laughs> let's, 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 it's, let's, it's, it's a it's it's a more definite realisation of the implications of Christianity. Okay. Yes, yeah. I, I think we can imagine a, a very similar panel mm. to this one talking about the trade unions and why we still need socialism and making some of the same, the same points about the differences within the traditions and the, and the arguments and so mm. on. But also, I mean, John's right, we can't say that church is doomed, is bound to decline, but nor can you say that socialism won't make a comeback. But still, you need to substantiate that with something a bit more, and there are people who will continue to argue. And I think this is the, the, 
the, the problem that you've identified, the, the, uh, the, the, the contracting of the political sphere, the lack of political alternatives, that's definite, obvious historical phenomenon that happened towards the end of the 20th, 20th century. Does the church have the answers? I mean, the church isn't. The church has can do a critique of capitalism and greed and so on, but it's 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 less profound than socialism. Well, and, I mean, no, no, on the contrary, I mean, on the contrary, it's only, sorry, only, just, Rebecca, only the Pope. Okay, so, sorry, sorry about, I mean, yeah. because actually, there you're immediately setting the boundaries. You're saying they're there only to give answers. If you're going to have a, 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 a sort of flourishing and stable community where everybody can come in and be part of it. You have to have a space where people can be heard. And the fact is, when people say that Anglicans are muddly, I think it's actually a very difficult path to tread, to have your own belief and also try and keep the door open, to say that you've got to respect the other people. And because of this line of cultural, sort of the culture that came out of the history, that you were there for everyone, and that came from a previous idea of duty, which is not the same we have today, but it's still got an element of interest and use about it, which is is that because I think it's my duty to listen to everyone in my diocese, I cannot dismiss them and therefore I must let their voice be heard. That is actually incredibly valuable in today's Absolutely. world. Yeah. And that is not about telling people what the answer is. You're asking for dogma all the time. When you, say, when you let their voice be heard, we have the internet. There's not a shortage of media. Not who's, in our the parliamentary question is who's, who's, So that you want to address parliament? Is it, is it, because I'm talking church? about parliamentary democracy. That is the way the laws are made at this point. You, you may be on Twitter, but that doesn't mean your laws are going to get passed. This is still a voice that is in the constitutional democracy. And that is why I think it's still valuable. That's an interesting point. Can I just take it back, Mark? Yeah. So we're talking here, and it's, it's directly related to the point that you raised. We're talking here about a, a church that should be strong, but we're also talking about it being a state church. And you were saying originally that well, those two strong. things are difficult There's a difference though between the, the, the strength of your Christology and the strength of your existence as a yeah. political force. And I think that's true. I mean, one thing that I wanted to say, because there, there seems to be a sort of movement here to say that the church exists in some sense to offer an anti-capitalist or a oh, no, argument. No, but there is a sense there, you know, I mean, I think Thatcher's been mentioned a couple of times as sort of a, a, a bogeyman. And it's worth saying, of course, that she was a very religious woman and, and indeed we're right near here also the uh, the Wesleyan Chapel where she was married. But they're everywhere. <laughs> there, well, yes, but not many of them are as yeah. buzzing as that one is yeah. on Sunday, interestingly yeah. enough. Um, it's worth saying that one thing that establishment does, if we're talking about, oh, it's a space for political debate, is it involves political capture by the establishment to a large extent. That tends to be the rule. If you look at Sweden, I mean, obviously, the King James Bible is, in some sense, a translation that offers a view on monarchical power, and that was part of the reason for it. In Sweden, um, the woman who is behind the translation of the Bible that is the equivalent now was Alva Myrdal. She wasn't religious, she was a leftist economist. She was married to Gunnar Myrdal, who got the Nobel Prize with Hayek. But she was the minister for religion in Sweden. And the translation that she did naturally reflected her beliefs, and that feeds in. And I would say that the Church of England, you know, over the 20th century has tended to be following the, the establishment's drift leftwards in, in its views economically, which isn't necessarily, I would say, a dogmatic thing. It happens because it's the established church and it follows that. And that's why even the Thatcher tried to talk to the church and say, I care about people, I'm a Christian, these things I think are still Christian values. And they wouldn't talk to her because she was an anti-establishment person. That's who, not true. They did went. talk to her. I mean, definitely. But also one of the jo the, one of the, the points about the church was also to speak to power, you know, speak on behalf of the unfortunate to power. And that is a role in most, you know, churches. And so that is also a role of there. And I think some of the sweeping statements we make about what is visible mm. about what the church is, does, I would argue that because of the cultural evolution, and we're not talking about a perfect world. I mean, I think if you're going to disestablish a church, you might as well disestablish Parliament as well. You know, you should, you should re redo everything. That is true, but this is what we've got. And if you're talking about how to keep a space where, yes, some people can be frightfully established and it's dreadful, but they can also have somebody who they are in a common corporate sense together with, so-called House of Bishops or the Church of the Communion or whatever it is, that also enables the space of different voices. And I think in one sense, because it's an old 18th century creation, Anglicanism, there is still a, a sort of... Um, because it's, it doesn't match in the, its structure with an awful lot of the ways that the present world is going, it leaves a space in it 
to allow other things to come through. And that is very valuable in today's world where everything is about whether you're an iPhone user or a Blackberry user or whatever it is. Everything is categorised. So that's what I'm trying Maybe to argue for. That's but the, there should be questions, I'm sorry. This is, yeah, exactly. This is a good opportunity now uh, with the uh, halfway stage, I know, uh, to come out to the audience, not just for questions, but also for points or observations of any yes. of the arguments that you've seen, any of the, the gaps mm -hmm. or the, the, uh, the contradictions or anything like that. So, yeah, I'm reminded listening to any talk about uh, the solace that people have found in the church and people have come back and told you so. I'm reminded of some graffiti from the 1980s which says, God is dead and an army of social workers have sprung up to take his place. And I think in that statement it kind of s sums up the gap between a kind of spiritual support which people have drawn from the church, the church and this idea that this can be secularized and formalized and you know it can be targeted uh, uh, and so on. There there's maybe uh, you know, a gap there that needs to be crossed over time, and, and I would be your vehement uh, anti anti religious bigot just to, so so before before you feel too warm and fuzzy. So just an interesting thing that I saw recently, I passed a church and uh, a beautiful church that I, I saw years ago. It's now got shops in the basement, boutiques. It's got a like an Eve Sung around. There's uh, Pilates going on in the uh, in the main hall, and uh, it just struck me that it's still a church, but the, the part of it that's actively a church is now much much diminished. And it, it did seem to me that this idea of what Jesus wanted is something with which the church is going to have to compromise, and it's 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 struggling to stay relevant. And that kind of summed it up for me. But my my point. My point really eventually is this, is that uh, Rebecca's idea that actually you need to leave time for a transition. Uh, there's no question that I, I think disestablishment is coming today. The Magistrates Association is voting on whether to um, uh, allow people in court, actually sorry, to no longer have the Bible as the means by which people swear uh, sincerity in court. I mean that's a huge plank of the legal uh, system which is about to disappear relevant to Christianity but the point is that the gap between what the social workers and state can do you know this idea that God's gone but social workers will do it there is obviously I think Rebecca as you as you, as you very astutely said you need time you can't you know a vacuum is a very bad thing uh, one of the things which uh, just just finally hamstrings yeah. the church is that it does have this inertia it's not being able to change that radically by nature religion doesn't and that's a great weakness for the church but that means that the process will be given time you can't just like chuck out the church and say okay you know we're going to drop for poor performance targets well, and so on there's an extraordinary degree of hubris in most of your presentations um, Britain would sell its granny in a way that is unthinkable even in the home of capitalism in the United States the voice of the established church seems to me to have made not one jot of difference to the ravages of, of um, the public sector, the ravages, and I, I, you know, I'm fairly centrist politically, but the ravages that we have experienced here have, are unparalleled in any capitalist country, including the United States, contrary to popular and populist opinion. And the idea, you know, I'm, I'm by background a Northern Irish Catholic who works in Scotland, the idea <laughs> that the only place that people come for succor is to an Anglican vicarage is palpable nonsense. I worked in a retreat house in North London in the 1980s and we had guys coming every day. The, you know, there's just so much hubris attached to this. I don't mind, I can give a damn whether the church is established or disestablished, but the hubris that is attached to it is just lamentable. Thank you very much. I suppose there's a question for all the panel. Um, Quite a lot of your arguments in favour of the church being either, um, well, in, in either sense, um, are sort of social arguments, the the social utility of the church. Um, in which case, uh, I mean, as opposed to the spiritual utility, in which case, is there a contradiction in terms in saying that there, there might be a case for a secular church? It doesn't just offer a social role, it does offer a spiritual role as well. I didn't focus on that because I don't like to assume that everybody in the room recognises the worth of a spiritual contribution. You know, for all I know, it, you may be an atheist and you may think that's completely pointless. I don't think it's pointless, uh, but that's why I wasn't arguing from that. Um, uh, that there was a hu huge spiritual impact as well. I mean, I think, uh, again, just let me take one example of a, um, somebody who became a, a member of our church in his 70s, he'd actually been going to church all his life because his father was a vicar, but he didn't become a Christian until his late 70s. And his entire life was transformed by that. Um, so there is, is a great spiritual contribution as well. I, I think you're, 
attack, um, your accusation of hubris was probably primarily directed at me. Well, and well, I don't think you should take it personally. I okay. about the whole thing. All right. Well, I apologise for no, no, perhaps, apologize. well, for, for perhaps saying a bit oh, too so glibly. This is a strong word, I think. If you're yeah, going to sort of, it does it's sound like an attack. Look, it's hubristic to think that you're making a difference when you're palpably not, because you make no difference, and, and that's true for most Christians. Well, you make no difference to the political economy in Britain. Excuse me, I was talking about, I mean, I may have exhibited hubris, and I apologise for saying that people don't call on, you know, Methodist vicarages in the same way or oh, whatever. I mean, yes, soup we had a Catholic yeah. soup kitchen now around the corner from us, which was hugely, uh, made a huge contribution. So I should not have implied that. But I, I know from people who, who called at our door that they called at our door because it was Anglican. I know that. Now, you say no difference made. I, I have to point you to individuals whose lives we were changing every week. OK, your, your accusation about the political scene may be fair. Um, I will leave others to answer that. But it is simply not true that we were not changing things because we were changing people. And one person whose life has changed, that is enough for me. You know, so it, it, it's not true that there is no impact there. And I know that some of that impact was because people, you know, they saw, they saw the vicarage. They saw it was next to the church. They, you know, they hadn't been to the church since they were this high, but they're absolutely desperate and they think maybe the vicar will help me. And, and sometimes we go, let me just fi finish, finish yep. by coming on to your point about um, changes coming, you know, it's a question of timing. I, I can't look into the future. I don't know when or whether the church will disestablish. You, you may well be right. I think the Church of England actually is in complete financial meltdown. And I think that will, will you know, I don't even know if there will be a Church of England in a generation's time because the, the, the finances are in such crisis. I mean, we can't afford to pay vicars, we can't afford to keep the vicarages going, we can't afford to keep the buildings going. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why disestablishment would be a huge favour to the church. But I, I think the church is there to serve, and I think we serve better how we are now. But what I do know is when change comes, the church will be nimble on its feet, because Christ's church... OK, there are some things that we believe forever, and we cannot change. There are some things we must change all the time. You know, when a lot of Christians fought for keeping Sunday special, but now that Sunday is no longer special, we have to have midweek things. We have to be in the supermarket. We have to be nimble in this way, and we will be. Thank you, Anne. Uh, my, my, my question back on, on that would be, do those individuals, and, and Ali, I want to leave it more as a point rather than a, rather than a question, but do those individuals come to the vicarage, come to the church, because it is the state church, or because... It was the state church, and well, so this is why will, that, will that not necessarily continue no, anyway? No, I don't think it. it again, I, I can't see in the yeah, future. But my much. hunch, my strong hunch, Isn't from it? living through it, yeah. is that as I say, it will last half a generation or a generation. It will, you know, mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. who who knew what an Anglican church was when they were little, like people who heard that, you know, King James Version or the Book of Common Prayer, who are now in their 60s, probably 50s, 60s, they still know it, and they can still recite it without having to look anything yeah. up. The next generation, they can't. Mm -hmm. And when disestablishment, if disestablishment comes, the people who remember it from their childhood are the people who will call on the vicarage door when they're desperate. Okay. But their children will not is my belief. There is just one thing I wanted well, to I say. Well, your, your point about the, the Bible yeah. being re removed yeah. in, in court laws, court, courts of law, which I think is you know, perfectly ex fine, acceptable. The only thing what I'm interested in is you're going looking towards the future from disestablishment. What kind of future structure can people come up with that will enshrine something about that space about being human in, in all its aspects and its vulnerability and its poverty and its identity versus the huge interests of money, political party, people with voices that are so much stronger than yours. So it, is there a way, I mean, that's, I think, the exciting area is trying to figure out what for the new generation, you know, you do end up with political structures. That's yeah. what happens. That's how your, your society around you will be governed. How do you think it's possible? And how would one try and envisage something that tried to preserve that sense, sense same sort of, uh, sacred is a difficult word, but that the idea that being human in itself is of a value. That's why we're all equal. Thanks, Rebecca. Could I, could I ask, Dolan, could I ask to, to look at this question of the, the, the church's impact on political economy? Uh, so we've, we've talked about it on an individual basis, but actually political economy, generally speaking, and whether or not the, the church's role as the state church has had an, an impact 
on its ability. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think it's had an impact on political economy, but that's not what the church is for. I, mean, I, I, I kind of think it's a mistake when people um, justify it in, uh, uh, in those terms. Um, you know, it, uh, everything in the, in the Gospels is about the next life. It's not, it's not really about how you reform this. It has consequences, of course, but, um, but I think that, that, that the, religion, the religion in religion has been, has been diminished the way you talk about it. Let me just pick up on the, 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 the jury um, question. I was in a jury earlier in the year, and I chose to affirm being a, being a non-believer. Actually, nine out of 12 of us just um, went with the Bible. But actually, if I were a Christian, I think I would still have chosen to affirm because I'd be the sort of Christian who doesn't believe swearing on a Bible is that significant. I mean, it's something ridiculous to me about character, keeping this book that no one ever reads and people just put their hands on it and say some words and there's some, some magic. That's not, it's not quite true that no one ever reads it. I, I, no, not that, the, <laughs> that the book given to me, the, I think the particular, particular oh, right, copy okay. given to me by, by the usher, um, that, that I think is an oddly fetishistic thing. And so mm -hmm. there's, there's one Christian writer who I admire, an American called Mark Driscoll, um, who planted churches in Seattle um, one of the least church cities in America. So he was starting from the opposite point. There wasn't an establishment to defend. He's, he's, he's building churches. And you know, there's been some great success in doing that. We, we see churches being built. It seems to me that there's a, there's a lack of faith in the power of the word, if that's, if that's what it's supposed to be, the power of, 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 of the, the, the Christian message to win people over. If you have to depend on a, a increasingly defunct, defunct institution to maintain it. So that's the challenge I would put. But the other side of that is I think there's a loss of faith in democracy. If we think the only way we can have space or a discussion or anything about non-economic uh, uh, non issues is by having, again, deferring to a church that most of us don't really believe in. I think we have to have a genuine democracy that, be, that begins from actually having those conversations in their own terms. As a practicing Orthodox Catholic, I don't really have a dog in this fight, but just want to ask uh, some people defending the idea of establishment on the panel. Um, can you justify from first principles the very idea of having a state established church? Um, because I can't really see how on, you know, the, the, what is the church for? The basic enterprise of having a church doesn't seem to me to be compatible with having it under the control of the state, which in a certain degree it is, um, we saw that with the women bishops argument. So can, can you defend that from first principles and in the very idea of the enterprise of what a church is for? Thank you very much. This is going back to Rebecca's point where um, I get the impression that your argument is based on the fact we need a state church to impose some kind of morality in democracy. I'm trying to say this, we can still go on, yeah. Yeah, what I'm saying is um, I feel that your argument is based on the fact that the church is the only place that provides morality, that, um, that we are inherently amoral and that we can manage without having representatives within the House of Lords, for example, and um, that another institution can be put in its place to Im impose moral values in democracy. And also, there was uh, Thatcherism has obviously been used a lot in this argument. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with Thatcherism, but I think that's a completely different argument. Um, but I think, as someone elected by the people, is it right for the church to question her? Like, I mean, obviously it's different in hindsight, but at the time, was it right for the church to question her? As an agnostic, I don't feel comfortable with the idea that there are people in my government my legislative in the legislative process that are put there purely because they are part of they're in a specific position in a church or they've been in a church for this amount of time in such a position i don't have a problem with them being there on their own merit but i don't feel comfortable with that i entered this debate thinking we're talking about what we have now and how do we move forward from it um this is not what i would if i was designing the world this is not the world i would have I think I was just saying that from my personal experience and looking at the way politics is working today, um, there is a space that is held by these privileged uh, people who've inherited a historical accident, right? So I'm not saying that, yes, they are you know, as good as elected people or whatever, but I think you have to also look at structures and symbols. Um, if you have uh, parliamentary democracy grew out of the idea that you started from a, a social setting where there were um, the upper house were the lords temporal and the lords spiritual and then you had the plebs which really was rich merchants and they were called the lower house and so that's how it evolved so there you're saying the world in the, this world the world that matters the people we should be listening to the people we are governing for are the rich commercial people and the lords who own all the land and then the lords spiritual who were compromised because they were also the landlords who held the land 
But because of the Christian message, and it would been if it had been a Muslim country or it had been a Catholic country, whatever, it would have been, you know, that there was also an element of a spiritual message. The point about that religious concept was it left room for saying that that kind of power is not the only kind of power and that human beings, individuals, are supposed to be of value too because the word of God tells us so. Love matters. So you're talking about then you had a political structure that kept that little bit of gap that said that just because I have the power, just because everyone agrees with me because I've only told you a partial story about what's going on, and so I, we've all voted for it. Uh, you know, I mean, people, people say, well, what about just being the elected majority, which is wonderful. But in certain situations, in certain climates, you will get 95% of the people in that particular tight little community who will say it's a good idea to string somebody up from a tree and burn them to pieces because they're a different coloured skin. Is that good? Well, the gap that's kept by the Lord's spiritual or that concept is supposedly it's still keeping a space to say those kind of questions need to come up. Now, what I'm saying is if you're looking at a future politics, how do you try and keep an icon, an image, a space in the framework that says that is what's going to have to be part of your thinking? Because I don't believe in, um, in the way the democratic per process is working at the moment, we, we still have enough space like that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to shut down the last vestige of a historic space, I think, would be a loss at this time. That's all I'm arguing. I'm not saying it's good or they should have been elected or whatever. I quite agree with you. I mean, when I look at most of the bishops, they maybe want to spit off the <laughs> But So, you regarding, know. so <laughs> regarding the first principles argument, John, if I could come to you Sorry, sure. to, to, to answer that, uh, yeah. you can, because I think you're it, probably it, the one it, that... It's very difficult to answer this because I think you have to start from the position that people, Christians in the Middle Ages, were in a way much more like Muslims. They just thought there was one body of Christians and it had a church aspect and a state aspect. What's interesting is that it is actually Christianity that began to secularize the political function, but it was still in a kind of organic unity. So there's, the church there's first principles so, in terms of history, yeah. but then there's also first no, principles no, in terms well, of how why you, you have legitimize to, it okay, now. You can only understand it historically. So it's not true that Anglican establishment means a kind of un-Catholic state control of the church. It's much more that after the crisis of the Reformation, you had to have, as it were, Christendom in one country. And so, for example, the crown, the sovereignty of the crown technically runs through convocation and now synod as much as it runs through parliament. It's not the state in, in control of the church. However, the point one has to grasp is that that confessional state. So establishment in that strong sense vanished a long time ago because once you got the situation where the people in the House of Commons were not all Anglicans, then the church had to say to itself, do we want to fight that or do we want to preserve the independence and freedom and liberty of our church? So one argument is deed, and I'm not dismissing this, is that we need a softer Scottish form of establishment where we have more control over our church. But here, candidly, I'm undecided because I wonder whether there is now a kind of new question of confessionality for the kind of reasons you're talking about, that if we don't admit the religious dimension, the Christian dimension, and the dimension of other faiths, because I would like to see imams in the House of Lords, absolutely. I would like to see a vocational House of Lords, not a ghastly New, you know, reproduction of the House of Commons, but another form of democratic representation. And so the question is precisely because we now see what secularity is leading to, you know, the absolute instrumentalization of the human person, and this is a new totalitarianism threatening in Europe, don't we now need to revisit? even the confessional character in a more confessional sense of the state. And it's that question that I think my kind of Anglo-Catholic and evangelical predecessors hadn't got to, because this is a new moment in history. Mm. I suppose that's a, that's a very mm. interesting point. Um, mm. And Donna, I don't know what your view, and, and, and Anne as well, actually. Mm. So this, this, this is something I was expecting mm. to come up to, be honest with you. What about if Anglicanism isn't the only state church? So um, the idea of having imams, of having, of well, having, uh, I think, I think Catholics. it's, I don't think, you know, I don't think you can undo tradition, and and I don't think Muslims would be the last people who thought you could do that. But nonetheless, already the Church of England does operate as a kind of carapace. There are also Methodist chaplains, it's mm -hmm. in, uh, in prisons. And can I just say, because I do think there's a lot of ignorance about this, the levels of church involvement, not just the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church, the Nonconformist churches, in civil society 
society is massive. They hold a lot of it together in terms. Uh, when the Archbishop of Canterbury announced his credit unions idea, he'd failed to do his research. I'm not attacking him. He didn't realize they were already happening. In many dioceses, they were already happening. And because, in a way, you know, secular association and secular politics, political bodies have collapsed, or despite the collapse in church membership, religious groups, you know, uh, Islamic groups as well, are very important in sustaining this. And I think this is crafting a new resistance to existing political economy. The, the kind of thinking that says society comes first, not the market nor the state. We need a market subordinate to society, what Pope Benedict called a civil economy, this far outweighs any of the thinking being done by Marxists nowadays. Although there are many secular thinkers also joining in this new kind of civil society based critique of both capitalism and the powerful state. So, you know, I think people just don't realize the degree to which yeah. religion is to That's, the fore now. Yeah, and, and it's, mm. worth, it's worth saying, of course, and this, you know, this goes back to something people were saying earlier when they were trying to suggest mm. that, oh, doing things, charitable things, helping people, whatever, is, is sort of a secularised form of, of Christianity, and it's not really the core of it. But, of course, these, were, these are biblical injunctions. These, totally, the, yes. the, the others shall know you as Christians by what, the way that you treat one another. Uh, mm -hmm. feed, the, feed the poor and heal the sick yes, and it's then also, visit you know, prisoners. When you're talking about the success of evangelical sects in America, it's partly because they do unbelievable number of practical things. Sometimes they do much better things yeah, yeah. than what they say. And it's interesting that the one country where people do go to the established church, which is Italy, mm -hmm. is rife with lay associations, you know, prison cooperatives, yeah. lay people organize. So people need to see that religion is relevant. Yeah, no, yeah. and of course yeah. it's one of the, the that, things that, that people Forget, got lost maybe. with the Reformation yeah. here because yeah. all of those confraternities were stopped as well as exactly. the yeah. monasteries. Exactly. It's often forgotten. Exactly. Can I, can I, uh, yeah. Dolan? I know you're chomping at the bit, but uh, can I see uh, some more questions? Uh, and I know I promised yourself a question uh, there, so just down at the front here. Um, I have been struck by a number of things. Uh, I think uh, the one, um, the the first one of which is, you know, the mention of uh, biblical uh, injunctions, and I think I do have a problem with that because it does sort of presuppose uh, that that in terms of looking after your neighbour in terms of, you know, or charity or, or, or did helping the sick and most of it, it does sort of uh, presuppose that that is a um, Judeo-Christian thing, which I think would have surprised, you know, the ancient Greek oh, no, and Roman uh, yeah. philosophers. You sure, know, on, on I mean, not sure. I mean, um, leaving all that aside, I think it was Queen Elizabeth who said that she had no interest in making windows into the emsiles of men, and it seems to me that um, those who argue against the establishment of the um, church are nonetheless arguing for that, namely, you know, namely, namely that there should be an overall, overarching, if you like, um, uh, structure which keeps people uh, on the safe and, like, say, in narrow, and it seems to me that um, those of who take a more um, robust uh, shall we say, um, attitude uh, towards the church, seems to me that um, in wanting, if you like, a more uh, fire and brimstone approach, you know, to yeah. you know, to 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 uh, the impact of um, of a religion in a more general society. It seems to me, you know, that they have no actually evidence that people are wanting more of that in their lives. I mean, I think actually it was a shift away from, if you like, um, from if you like, um, a simple faith approach onto a more scientific, onto a more rational thing that you know that did that. And I can't really see the genie being put back into the bottle and stuff, not unless you want to smash the bottle anyway. Thank you. That, just just very quickly, end, yeah, thank you. Uh, it point. just seemed to me, though, that um, those of who actually are, are arguing for uh, a more conservative social and uh, religious message from the church, and I'm not necessarily including those people on the panel in this, but those of who um, are arguing for that, it seems to me the sort of people um, who keep their petrol and their matches close by ready for the next bonfire of the vanities. <coughs> My daughter's just spent two, uh, two terms studying Buddhism at school. Are we having this discussion the way we are? Because the Church of England has no input to speak of into school curricula. I've just been to a talk on, on, on the history syllabus. Religion wasn't mentioned. Um, that we know that Christianity underlies the culture of this country, whether people are professed to be Christians or not. Mm. Yet and the church doesn't seem to be able to affect what's taught in schools. Mm -hmm. Can I just come back to your previous question? Um, I mean, well, and the short answer is having imams and rabbis in the House of Lords would not do it for me. No, that wouldn't solve the problem. And uh, I, I mean, call me an extremist, but I favor a simple Republican form of government. Actually, I don't think you need an unelected second chamber. I think that 
it means we, and we, need, we need, a, need a more mature democracy than we have now for, for that to work. That's not going to be true, but I think that's a priority. We need to work on that rather than um, looking for um, bishops or anyone else to hold us in place. But republicanism in government is a bit like Presbyterianism in religion. <laughs> <laughs> in, in it, yes, sorry. <laughs> in that it's more, 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 di more diplomatic, yeah. but it's not simply about individuals, yeah. because there's a tradition that is embodied in the system of elders, and there's a scripture which is there. Yeah. And to have any political um, body effects, it's not just about getting a bunch of individuals in the room and saying, what do you think? It has to refer to a tradition, and that's what we've lost. You know, the, the whole mm -hmm. no, the end of the 20th century in, in Britain was about the demise of the left-wing tradition and very quickly the demise of the right-wing tradition, which had been in, in opposition to it. Mm -hmm. I think you can see that reflected in the Church of England. But I think what, what we need then is to, to reconstitute some form of politics. And, you know, Christians have as much a role to play in that as anyone else. Whether an established church has a role to play in that, I think, is far more um, tendentious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Anne. Well, if I could pick up on your question about um, uh, education... Um, and faith, uh, because my husband, as I say, was a parish vicar and is now a school chaplain. So I, I'm now learning about that aspect of an established church. Right now, he's not entirely representative in that he's in a private school, not a, not the public sector. But nevertheless, I see. I mean, coming back to the question about could we argue this from first principles? I couldn't. I could not argue for an established church on first principles. I couldn't argue for the, the goodness of love on first principles. It, it, it's there, and I see the good it does. And, and um, you know, I sort of know my colours the wall a bit earlier in saying that I'm rather a fan of this sort of Anglican muddle. Um, and I see in what my husband is now doing that the best of this sort of muddle, in that he, as a Christian and as a chaplain, he is able to teach the faith that he believes in um, week by week on Wednesdays and Sundays and what he preaches, but he also in the classroom is teaching about other faiths. Uh, and all I can say is that I think this works. You know, he doesn't have to apologize for what he believes. Uh, he does teach tolerance and, and, you know, he is supporting other faiths as well. And this is where I think the whole thing is rather sort of wondrous, really. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that Jonathan Sachs has, has talked about <clears throat> the tolerance of Anglicanism, and perhaps I could just unpack that a little bit. He talks about coming uh, in, in the 40s, I, I think it was the 40s, to this country as a little Jewish boy, and going to a Church of England school. And what he found was that there was space for him because his teachers believed something themselves, they knew the value of belief, and they knew the value, therefore, of his belief. And all I can say, you know, it's not a great logical argument, it's not an arguing from first principles, all I can say is that it works. Um, and it's okay. not the only way of making it work, but with I this love question it of, With this question of, of, of it works, and, and, and it's a nice point regarding um, perhaps your first point uh, around um, people going going to a vicarage as a first port of call, if that's if that's if that's a. Not to always, go. not everybody's first no, port of call, but it works uh, for some people. You know. Does the wider system work when, in fact, you have um, such conflicting opinions uh, and such conflicting views on the way a country should run itself? So you've got religious values, and then you've got views in wider society, and they, at the moment, appear to not match to such a degree that they're beyond compromise. Both well, sides are beyond see, compromise, and how I can you uphold those two things? Well, people yeah, thought that when down, divorce was introduced, that it proved not to be the case. But you see, I think deep down, Jake, that it, it, it does work. Okay, yeah, there are lots of uncomfortable bits. You know, it annoyed me a lot when David Cameron waded in about women bishops, about which I, he understands nothing, as far as I can see. Um, none of his I mean, business, I think. Um, and, you know, there's a great muddle over the gay issue and all that sort of stuff. But on the important things... You know, we've got hundreds of years of, of Christian values enshrined in our law. Is that right to impose that on people who don't believe in Christian values? Well, actually, I think yes, because I believe in those values because I think God established them, you know, so I think they work for everybody. And, and, and that's why we have a liberal democracy. That's why we live in a country that can criticise the church, because Christianity has established that freedom, that freedom of thought, that freedom of, of speech and so on. So, you know, I just come back to this thing that it, it au fond, it works. In, in the details, it's a mess. But actually, you know, deep down, we live in an amazingly, wonderfully tolerant 
fair country compared with a lot of the world. And thank God we do. Yeah, and, you know. And, yeah, Mark. Uh, I think I think you know my, my general thought on this is be careful what you you wish for. I mean. There are different forms of secular society in the sense of you know, not having an established church you might end up with. You might mm. end up with France, which some people might see as an Enlightenment model, but you know, I'd say is actually quite an illiberal place with banning burqas before mm -hmm. us. Or Turkey, indeed. Yeah, well, you yeah. don't want to end up there. And um, on the other hand, you might get America. Uh, I wouldn't you might be there have, either. You might have a very intense <laughs> religious community, but it's much more often a strict on social issues that you don't like. Strict churches are strong. What we did in this country was create a church that could survive and be quite reasoned and have room and act as a carapace and do all of these things, uh, but that wouldn't be very intense because it wouldn't be turning so much in a sort of market sense to its believers uh, in order to keep itself going and to, and to earn attendance. And that's going away. It's going away for economic reasons primarily. And what we get in its place it will be hard to know, but it, it, it probably won't be as good. And actually, just to add to that, I mean, I love that. Elizabeth's um, declaration that she she didn't want to make windows into men's souls and 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 that is what is so, so wonderful about the Church of England that as I said at the very beginning you aren't required to believe certain things you, you know she didn't she was a wonderfully tolerant that her Protestantism that she established was a wonderfully tolerant that's thing. A, that's a good, I, I heard there in the Vegas corners. Well, uh, you are. And well, I think the thing is, I, there's a lot of eliding of, 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 of categories because, in one sense, the point about the Church of England is an established church. It is a Christian church in its nature, but it's also had a particular cultural evolution as a Christian church that, who had a duty to serve the whole of the community yeah. of England. Exactly. And so, I think. Although it will no doubt be wiped away and with new generations, I think if, in fact that we can always learn a bit from our past. And there is actually an element in our English culture which gave rise to things like the rights of man and even women and various other things, liberties that we now all cherish, which came out of a, an Anglican-informed faith, not exclusively, but which one of the things the Anglicans are good at is they've had hundreds of years of trying to keep together an intention and a broad church completely opposing sections. They are made up of evangelicals, supposedly evangelicals, Catholics and liberals, supposedly all sworn enemies. But the whole idea of the Anglican communion idea was that you could find a way through reason, tradition and faith to keep these things together. So in one sense, they're an institution that has had a many, many years of trying to figure out how to keep warring parties in a, it, together in a flourishing community. And that is not an easy business. And in our world today, where people would rather run away and say, this is total mess, let us make it, smash it to pieces and walk on to something else. Well, you're human, you never run away from yourself. So a tradition that has actually got a strong intellectual tradition of trying to figure out how to compromise and care for your neighbour without compromising your own most cherished beliefs is actually a very valuable tradition that should not be thrown away lightly. Mm. That's all I would say. Yeah, um, I, I'm, maybe it's because I'm not a cradle Anglican and I'm, and I'm half Celtic, but I'm, I'm not quite so at ease with all this pragmatism and lack of principles. I mean, easy, easy. obviously <laughs> Anglicanism is not the only way to go. It's no, not, this I is the truth. Everyone says, if I'm saying one thing, yeah, you must believe it's own, me. And it is there <laughs> for historical and pragmatic reasons. But I do think you can also justify it on first principles, which I've tried to do. And I think the most notable thing is that maybe Anglicanism is a, is a particularly radical kind of pan-sacramentalism in which when you go upwards, you don't leave behind this earth, you also go outwards. Mm, it's a you know, double dilation of the heart. And you find this in Hooker, you find it in Traherne, in metaphysical poetry, and it's not all as vague and mushy as I think sometimes is being um, presented um, fr fr from this panel. It has a real theological and philosophical rationale. Can I just rationale. say one thing? Yeah. 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 So if it, it, just one thing. When everybody says it's mushy, you try it. It is not yeah. mushy. It is bloody yeah. hard work. No. And it is actually where a lot of people have found true um, exposition of love and sacrament. Yeah. But, and although that sounds horribly yeah. Christian, I'm terribly sorry, but it is not mushy no. when you actually okay. practice we it. We agree about it. We agree about it. Is, uh, Tolerance can, is but, hard, people. Yes, <laughs> but not in <laughs> but if I can just say something about education, I totally think it's important to 
learn about the world religions and, and France is discovering it has to now teach religion. Um, but I, I do think that children find it incredibly puzzling if they don't understand that they also come out of a religious tradition. Then it's just a lot of weird stuff that other people do. So they need both. And, and you know, I teach in a department of theology and religious studies, and I profoundly believe in that combination at school level and, and, and at university level. Thank you. Dylan. Yeah, I mean, just to come back to the point I started with, I think that what I object to is a, is a, a, a state with quasi-religious powers, and it, which is seen as the heart of the nation in a sense. The, that, all that, states have quasi-religious well, no, powers. Well, I'm, not picking, yeah. I'm not picking the Church of England uh, in that respect. Do you but, know that France, but, no, France, the French government intervenes in the choice of the Bishop of France, Paris? France was the, yeah. next, France was the yeah. example I was going to give. Yeah. In fact, even, yeah. uh, even around the revolution, mm. there was a quasi-religion built up around that, which yeah. was because of this, this yeah. idea that you needed to have some kind of overarching yeah. thing that people could subscribe to um, and that everyone had to subscribe to which is how you end up with the authoritarianism of, of banning burqas and so yeah. on i think um we should uh be a bit more relaxed and you know liberate the evangelicals from the church of england but allow, allow the very I, look, i've got to ask you this question isn't it the case that we're saner about things like burqas we we adopt a kind of middle line partly because we're not a completely secular state and we're not a theocracy either and establishment kind of holds that middle space doesn't it, it well it makes us more liberal not less in it, the good sense it's difficult to say which factor is this and decisive britain's a very different society but i think we have to have faith in, uh, in people's ability to, to to be tolerant without being told to be tolerant by the church um, i think that we need to have well, to come back well to that's the, wishful, yeah. that's utopian the thinking. The only thing I, I would say also that the idea <laughs> yeah. that you're being told that, to be tolerant by the church is a very 19th century idea. Yeah. When, since when did the, the state church ever tell you what, you know, that everybody goes on, they're too mushy, they don't tell you well, anything. The, the very idea that you have to keep everyone together in one church, why? No, if you believe different things, point, go I'm separate saying. ways. No, that's that, fine, that, that, that any, any religious movement should be built on free association. You mm. associate with people you agree with. You don't have to pray with Muslims to tolerate Muslims and get along with Muslims and work with them in the secular sphere. No. You don't have to pretend that everyone's part of the same religion. And it seems to me that's the logic of establishment. Of, a, of an established church and established okay. English, um, I, yeah, I, I can identify with that. Um, if there's any, any further points either from, from, you, from you two, we, we should be drawing to it a close in the next, in the next few minutes. Well. Um, I'm just going to give a historical example just because I like it and I, I haven't had a chance to mention it. In Japan, at the end of the Second World War, they disestablished the Shinto religion in which the emperor was not just head of state but was actually a god, in which priests were civil servants, in which while you could have small other religious things, you, it was hard to get approval and it was very constrained. And there was an extraordinary explosion of religious activity. They called it... Kamigami no Rashu Awa, and uh, the pronunciation's off, but what it means is uh, the rush hour of the gods. They went from <laughs> 2 million in non-traditional religions in 1900 to 21 million in 1975. The Saka Gokai went from 60 members in 1937 to 8 million in 1972. Do not assume that disestablishment is the sign of the end of, of churches and religion. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, yes, just, just a little sort of... Um, uh, analogy, perhaps, to to, uh, to to wrap up, not necessarily the whole thing, but wrap myself. Um, I, I do sort of the day from time to time. And um, again, that was established by Lord Reith as a Christian thing. Mm. And it has evolved, and quite right that it's evolved. Now, that slot is under attack the whole time. How can you justify, you know, this faith slot in the prime time of our flagship news programme? It can't really, you know. What is it doing there at, at quarter to eight when we should have the prime minister on or whatever it is? How in this, in a, in a, in a you know, country where most people don't, I don't know how you can justify it. But it is one of the most popular slots on the program, and that uh, th that was founded as a Christian moment in a news thing is now quite rightly also a Muslim, a Jewish, uh, a Hindu, a Sikh. You know, has all rarely these... an atheist. No, it isn't. A, it's never an atheist uh, <laughs> slot, and that is one of the reasons why it's under attack. Because, but because Jake, uh, atheism is not a faith. If, with due respect, well, with due respect, if you put, a, 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 if you allowed an atheist or a humanist slot there, and and people do argue, well, atheists and humanists argue for it. I don't know if anybody else does, but if you did that, it would become an individual slot, 
And as soon as it becomes an individual slot, it would fall apart. The whole thing is it's an established Christian thing that has shown tolerance to other faiths, but it has to be a faith thing. And again, you know, how the heck would you argue for that on first principles? You couldn't, but people love it, so leave it. I think uh, that would be a pertinent point to end today. So thank you very much uh, for that. It's not where we wanted to be, but it's where we are. I suppose, for all of the year. <laughs>